So let me start by saying uh, thank you for uh, being here. Welcome. This is the second day of Baltimore Innovation Week. Uh, it's a chock full of stuff. So this session is called Understanding Your Customer Strategies for Success. And uh, Bob and my collaborator here, uh, I'm, I'm, my, I'm, I'm Brendan McAdams, my collaborator Bob and I are going to spend the next few minutes kind of talking about sales and uh, and then and then kind of more generally communication skills from the perspective primarily from uh, the founder, entrepreneur, startup perspective. And so just a little background on, on me, I, I'm, uh, uh, I've been in sales, in enterprise sales, and in telecom and financial services and ultimately healthcare for the last several decades, longer than some of you have been alive. And, uh, and uh, in enterprise sales, um, for startup companies, technology companies, companies have gone IPO, and I've been consulting with tech companies, and now I'm the founder of, co-founder of a technology company that uh, called Expertscape that identifies and objectively ranks medical expertise by a very specific topic. And so I kind of lived a lot of this stuff. So what I thought I'd do is spend a few minutes kind of talking about, about sales from the standpoint of a founder or an entrepreneur or someone that's got a bootstrap in a company. And in a lot of cases, um, if you're a founder, you're focused on product development and product design and all the kind of fun stuff that goes with, uh, with being a, an entrepreneur. But at some point, you really need to focus on sales. And I would argue that you probably should, you know, ideally, you're doing it already. Uh, and, uh, but if you don't, it's because in a lot of cases, people would rather do something other than sales. Sales is a bit of a dirty word for some, and, uh, and, and, or it's at the best, you know, it's, it's uh, inevitable, you have to do it, or it's tolerable at best. Uh, but I'm going to argue that um, the really good founders uh, and really good entrepreneurs are going to find a place in their repertoire to be at least adequately good at sales. And and there are a lot of reasons for that, especially for, uh, for a, a young company just starting out. I mean, not only is it revenue, it's also... Uh, it's important from the standpoint of being able to uh, uh, confirm your product, uh, confirm your assumptions, and or disprove some of your assumptions in terms of the product. It's it's motivational and aspirational for to make sales, to be involved in sales. Nothing motivates uh, an, an entrepreneurial venture more than landing a deal, and especially landing a big, important deal. Nothing will drive a company forward quite like that. Uh, it's uh, it's important from the standpoint of investors. Uh, investors are going to want revenue. They're going to want customers. Nothing will imp impress uh, people when you go for f funding. You know, ultimately, for a lot of you, you want to get funding. Nothing is nothing is as compelling as having customers and revenue. And finally, uh, at some level, it's it's just satisfying to be able to sell uh, because it confirms uh, you're, that you're solving a problem. Hopefully it's an important problem. And and ideally, and, and, and on top of that, you're getting paid to do it. And those are kind of important drivers and things worth focusing on. So as a founder, as a, an entrepreneur, somebody inside your company is going to have to know how to be successful in sales, and chances are it's you. And if it isn't you, even if it isn't you, you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to understand sales well enough not to screw up deals that do come. So, at some level, you're going to want to know what takes place in order to make a sale happen, and um, uh, you know, and, and how how to help advance that along. And there, so, I've spent a lot of time, uh, as I've said, in kind of the preamble here, um, in terms of being in sales, and and, and and I've spent a lot of time thinking about sales process, refining my sales process collecting things, and as I mentioned, I wrote a book about it. And so in the next kind of few minutes, what I'd like to do is just spend, at the start of this, spend a few minutes kind of talking about three things that I, if you distill anything away from what I have in the, in the book, that I think are critically important for a founder, an entrepreneur, anyone that's trying to get a new idea, buying for an idea, uh, it's going to be three basic fundamental ideas. One is talk less listen more. Number two is, do what you say you're going to do. And number three is, 
become good at ruthlessly qualifying. And so, if you, I don't have to get, you don't have to be a sales machine in order to be successful in selling. But if you can, if you can kind of spend some time and be good at paying attention to those three, those three fundamental components, you're a long way towards uh, being successful or being successful enough to advance the goals of your company. So, what do I mean by uh, uh, talk less and listen more? And it sounds obvious, but um, as a founder, as an entrepreneur. You know more about your cool product, your cool solution than anyone else. You want to tell people about it. But I would argue that there's another way, there's a better way, a better strategy, and that is to ask important questions, meaningful questions, and then shut up and listen. And then I mean, literally, truly, truly listen uh, and, and, and be, be engaged, be curious, be complimentary, and then ask the important follow-up questions. And this is obvious stuff, I know, but very few people do it. And very few founders do it, very few good salespeople do it. And the, the reason why this is critically important to consider and uh, really practice is that as you get good at that, if you allow, if you create an environment that allows a customer or a prospect to, to tell you to talk, uh, you can guide that conversation, but if you allow them to talk, they'll end up telling you exactly what it will take to buy, what's important to them, what's what they like, what they don't like, what their business problems are, and ultimately, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as a startup startup organization, that information is invaluable. So. My, my, again, my suggestion to you is, in these situations, is to ask important questions, ask, ask interesting questions, and then be quiet. Listen, don't pitch, don't argue. You, there's plenty of time to spend time talking about your customer, but everything you can do to gather more information about, about that, that, uh, what their, that their perspective is going to inform your strategy. It's going to make your product better, it's going to make your solution better, it's going to allow you to anticipate the next sales call. All these things are critically important. So, can you give an example of an important question to ask? You've said that twice, and I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean. Well, it's, it's uh, at, a, at, a very important, at a very basic level, you want to understand what is the, what is the problem that they're dealing with. It's not how your, your product works, it's what what's on their mind? What is what matters to them? And 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 then figure out if you've got a fit. And and that's part of this. We'll go back into this in the third. This is around qualifying and the importance of qualifying. But yeah, it's it's being able to understand from the customer's perspective because frankly, they don't care about you. They care about themselves. They care about getting your problem solved. And if you can help them get there, they are willing. They're probably willing to listen. So then, then this, the second component is you do what you say you're going to do. And again, brain dead simple, but it's amazing how infrequently it happens. And that is, show up when you say you're going to show up, do what you say you're going to do, deliver on time, or ideally a little bit early. Admit when you make a mistake, um, and basically follow up. But it also means, in addition to that, not doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing. You know, don't don't do stupid stuff. Don't commit to things that you shouldn't commit to. Don't agree with a customer just because you think you have to agree with a customer. If it doesn't fall in line with your vision for the company, and if what they're saying doesn't make any sense, you should you shouldn't be agreeing. You should move off. You should, you know so. So you don't want to you don't want to commit to building some one-off product enhancement that's not going to that's not consistent with whatever your vision for the company is because because that's going to lead you towards shitty deals and you do not want to get shitty deals time is of the essence especially for fragile young companies that, that are early in their development stage so it's critically important for you not to waste time on stuff and shitty deals are the easiest way to kill a good company. So, um, and part of what sales is about is avoiding 
bad deals. It's not just closing good deals, it's avoiding bad deals. And which gets us to the third point, and that is uh, ruthless uh, qualifying. And this is, ruthless qualifying is different than the other two. Those, the first two kind of points are obvious and fundamental and it's easy to get. Qualifying is hard. And it's hard because it relies heavily on um, it relies heavily on experience. In a lot of cases, you don't have that experience. You don't have that direct sales experience. You don't know. And so it becomes critically important for you to find out ways to qualify deals. And, and because a bad deal, wasted time on deals that aren't going to close, that aren't good for the company, not only waste your time, they waste resources, they waste motivation, they waste your credibility in the marketplace, and as a fragile given company, again, you can't afford that. Uh, to the degree to which you can avoid bad deals and waste of time just enhances your abilities, your potential for success. So being able to qualify is critically important. So how do you do that if you don't have experience? Well, at one level, you need to know like who should you be talking to? Who's your ideal customer? And, and that sounds simple, but once you define that, you ask yourself, over and over again, are you talking to that person? Are you really talking to the right person? The person that should be buying? The, per the person that you should be talking to? And if you're not, you're pro again, you're probably, your odds of success have gone that. <clears throat> you, need, you, you need to be rigorous and really critical of yourself. And one of the things about that means is you can't BS yourself. And the problem there is, is that as a founder, as a startup, it makes a lot of sense sometimes to be as you said. It's a survival skill. You have to be able to do it when you should. But when it comes to deals, fooling yourself into thinking a deal is going to happen when you know it's not is just is death. And so you have to become better at understanding. It's important to become better at understanding when a deal is real and when it's not. And and so one of the things you want to do, one of the practices you want to consider is. Ask yourself the really hard questions whenever you're in a sales situation. What could go wrong? What are the obstacles? Why won't they buy? What's it going to take for them to buy? And, and what's it going to take for them to actually deploy? These are all critically important. And when you get good at this, you won't ask these things just of yourself. You'll ultimately start asking your customers these things. When you get really good at this, you'll ask your customers those very same questions, and then you'll know, then you'll be able to qualify, and then you'll know, you'll be able to go back to the first, the first point, which is, you'll, you'll, understand, you'll, you'll, you'll be listening for the, these right clues, and ultimately you'll be able to, to, to know whether or not to follow through on this deal or that deal or the next deal. If you, follow, if you can focus on those three key components, just talking less, talking less, listening more, do what you say you're going to do, and learn how to qualify, really be ruthless in terms of qualifying, your, your chance to success, your ability to succeed as an entrepreneur, as a startup, as a bootstrapper, go way up. So that's kind of my, if, you know, I spent almost 206 pages writing a book. In a, in, in a nutshell, those are the things that, if I had three things to tell you to take away, those would be the takeaways. Now with that, we'll step back a little bit and we'll, we'll talk less about sales and more about uh, something more universal, communications. And Bob, I'll let Bob kind of take over. Bob's written a book as well, uh, 55 Soft Skills for... It's a lot of employee and organizational success. Yes. That's yep, it's all it's based right on research on. that he did with his co-author. And, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, it helped me with uh, getting my book off the ground. So with that, I'll let you uh, spend a few right. minutes and then... And after that, we'll kind of open it up and yeah. people can chat. So, so Brendan, I think there's a synergy between what you were talking about and what I talked about. Um, and, and I should say, I'm uh, CEO of a company called Breakthrough Solutions. We do coaching, training, and speaking on how people interact with other people. And you may say, well, that doesn't relate to sales. But actually, it really does. Because we know, you didn't mention this, but two things about sales that you have to factor in. One, every buying decision is an emotional decision. We're seeking pleasure or we're seeking to avoid pain. And that's yep. where I think your questions come into play. Yep. If you can get the person thinking about what's motivating them. The second thing is, 
we sell ourselves. You can't make me buy. If I, yes, I can be really thirsty, yeah. but you can't make me buy this. You can always say, boy, Bob, you're really thirsty. This is so cool and refreshing, but at the final decision, it's mine, not his. And I think that's one of the things I have learned in my journey as a salesperson in my career is that I can't make you buy. So if I come in and say, Brendan, I do this, 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 you need this, you need this, you need this, yeah. your response is, dude, step back. Yeah. And I think that's a really important starting point that sort of takes us from what you're talking about to what I talk about. So what I talk about is how people engage with other people. And uh, the book about the 55 soft skills, happy to talk about a little bit. We did some research and found that there are actually 55 skills that we use in the workplace to engage with other people. Everything from empathy, how you empathize, to delegating tasks, time management, patience, resilience, sharing a vision if you're at that high level in an organization, how do you share a vision for what you want to do, and there are a whole bunch of others. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I've evolved from that. That was about two years ago, and now I'm putting together a book that talks about three breakthrough communication skills. And these three skills, and I'm going to walk through each of them, relate to the whole sales process. In fact, it's a great example, and I'd love when I get done going through them yeah. to get your feedback yeah. in fact. So the first one is attunement. If you're going to have any kind of successful communication, whether it's sales, whether it's a how, uh, going to investors, whatever it would be in, in your organization, you've got to be attuned with that other person. Attunement is how you and that person stay in tune. Attunement comes from the word tune, of course, and think of a guitar. If you have six strings, if one's out of tune, it sounds really lousy. If it's in tune, it performs really well. It sounds really good. Although I play a little guitar and it doesn't really sound good, but it should. But we want to be in tune with that other person. So being in tune is, first of all, being respectful of their situation. You know, if you were saying earlier, this is a great week for you because you don't have a lot of deadlines. So you're here. That's a great insight. I'm going to guess if I called you Ted next week and said, hey, Ted, Let's get together for coffee. You're like, dude, can't do it. Recognizing the ebb and flow of people's life can be helpful. Understanding when they're available, when they're not. Understanding what's going on in their head. What some of their concerns would be. Brendan set this up really good at the beginning, talking about where all you are in your journey. His comments mirror what you're looking for. There's a synergy there. There's an attunement. If he came in here and talked about, you know, when you're running a corporation with 6,000 employees, you'd be like, dude, why are you here? <clears throat> That's not going to fit. So being attuned is the first thing. The second thing is experience management. And this is something that I find more and more is overlooked in the business climate. How do we manage our own experiences and those experiences of other people around us to make better decisions about how we should act with our business. So, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I've had this experience a number of times where we make a decision in an organization, we do it, and then after it fails, and eventually something will fail, someone goes, I could have told you this was going to fail. Well, why didn't you? You didn't ask. Well, we're not managing the experience. The other thing is, we don't manage our own internal experiences. We have a gut. We all have a gut. And as I get older, I realize more and more, I have to trust my gut. My gut is that thing that says, hey, you've been in this place. You've felt this feeling before somewhere else. You need to pay attention to it. And so often, I don't know if it happens for you, but for me, I don't pay attention to that because the data that I'm looking at at that moment or what people are telling me, says do A, but my gut's saying do B. And more and more, when I follow B because my gut says do it, even though the data doesn't always support it, I find I get better outcomes. And when we're working with a team, whether it's in an incubator like this or anywhere else, getting other people's opinions, but not just going, oh, tell me what you think, and then dismissing it, but taking it and really considering it and asking the right questions. That's where your idea of questioning for that experience can be really valuable. What experiences can you draw on? Is there a parallel company out there that's done what you've done? Maybe it's in a completely different sector, but what's their trajectory? And can you follow that? Can you learn from their great steps and their missteps? So that's the second one, experience management. And the third one is storytelling. 
How do you communicate information? And this is both internal and external. How, what do you tell yourself when you get up in the morning? Seriously. I got, I got up this morning and said, I had this great opportunity to share a stage with Brandon, which is like, I, I told my wife this morning, he's like one of my favorite people in the world, and then I get to share with him and, and be on par with him. It's just awesome. And I'm so excited to be here for that reason only. But also, this is an opportunity to share what I'm passionate about with people who clearly are interested. You couldn't have all been here for the bagels. So there's got to be something. And there's an opportunity to give back. But I could have gone a different route. Oh my God. It's Tuesday morning. I've got a busy week. I've got to dress up. I've got to shave this morning. I'm going to have to sit in front of people. My throat's sore. I've got allergies. And we do that sometimes. Right? We tell ourselves an internally a wrong story. And when people buy, they buy our passion. I'm convinced that when people buy what Bob offers, it has more to do with who I am than what I know. I don't know if you experienced that with me, but, but I think there's a, there, there's a way that we show up to our ideal clients or customers that makes them go, I am better with this guy in my corner or this woman in my corner than being on my own. And so it's how we tell that story, and, and we communicate that the language we use to describe what we're building is critical. And that's where asking the right questions. When I ask my customers questions, I get the language. I had one of my customers explain to me, you know, Bob, you helped me reinvent myself. I was like, whoa, what a great verb. I got to I got to test that verb on some people. So I went to a networking event, and for the first time, I said. I help people reinvent themselves, companies reinvent themselves. Five people, five people who have seen me talk a number of times, came up to me afterwards. I didn't know you did that. What have I been talking about for the last three months? <laughs> I wasn't using the right language. The language we use, the stories we tell, and how we communicate it is critical. And it's not just the words. It's the way we dress. Brendan and I had a discussion yesterday about how to dress for this audience. I'm not wearing a three-piece suit. He's not wearing a three-piece suit. There's no tie. I almost went with the hoodie and jeans, but I don't own a gray hoodie. <laughs> or black hoodie. Do I? And there you go. But how do you tell that story in a way that people, people respond to it? They feel comfortable with it. They feel it's inviting. And that changes from situation to situation. And unfortunately, all, the, all three things I described, the attunement, the experience management, the storytelling, the only way to develop those skills is to go through it and practice it and be ruthless with yourself about what worked and what didn't work. Even better, to have a mentor. You know, someone who can really look over your shoulder and go, hey, I saw you give that presentation Tuesday morning. You kind of rushed your words. You kind of did this. You didn't do this. You... That's how we grow. It's hard to get that feedback. Believe me, I own a business. It's hard when people go, you know you're doing this wrong? But sometimes I listen to that, and it's actually really useful information. And it helps inform that story going forward. So those are the three, what I call, breakthrough communication skills. And Brendan, I'd love to get your feedback on those three things. Well, the, uh, yeah, the tuneman one, right out of the gate, uh, is is important because the, the point I made earlier is people don't care about they don't care about you or your product. They care about how your product helps them. And and so whenever you're you know in any sales situation, you really need to be able to put yourself in the customer's shoes in in a very in a very real sense. Like what are they going through? And you can't in, in most cases you can't know that if you're not having a conversation with them and listening to what they're saying. And, uh, you know, if you're selling a product into a certain industry and you don't really understand that industry very well because it's a, yours is a generic kind of a platform tool, you're, you're going to have a tough time being able to articulate what the value is until you understand what they're up against. And some of that is, is understanding the, the, the gyrations in their industry or legislation or it could be any number of things. And your customers will tell you that. That's the, that's part of that too, if you're Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I think that Tuneman really does is it helps get past the price game. Yeah, you know, because there's always someone who can come in with a lower price yeah. and you're gonna lose on price. Yeah. 
I, I was speaking at a lumber industry national event, and they were all talking about the prices are so low for hardwood lumber. Yeah. And I was explaining to them that the only way you're going to rise out of that is you've got to develop relationships with your customers, yeah. where you do something someone else can't do. Because if I sell you this for a buck, someone's going to make it ninety cents and then eighty cents, and then you're going to, the price game is a no win. Right. My best customers never ask me about price. And you probably find it too when you're working with experts, Gabe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they get to a solution area, don't you find me? I'd love to call when they go, by the way, yeah. what's this cost? Yeah. Like, it's an afterthought. They're, they've sold themselves at that point. Well, the, 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 the notion of price becomes an issue when what you do is generic. And the minute you, and you know, if you're creating something new, chances are it's A, it's not generic. Or it better not be perceived as generic. And the best way to do that is to be able to understand the perspective of your customer and then be able to articulate how this, how whatever it is you do complements, helps them avoid pain or get pro, you know, get pleasure. Um, and so, the, and that, and that, Moves you away from being generic because once once you're once you're not generic, price becomes a non-issue. And so yeah, so that's the point. The, the other thing I, I just want to say is, and, and I worked at Johns Hopkins University for four years teaching engineering students, and a lot of them were developing businesses, and they had the same statement to me when I said, "How are you going to find a customer? We're going to do Google Ads, or people will find us." I can tell you right now, that doesn't work. You're going to have to figure out who your customer is, and you're going to have to do hard work to get in with them. Yeah. As, as you and I both experience yeah. with our business endeavors. E yeah, even, even customers that, even products that are uh, designed for, to scale, that are, that are based on purchasing decisions that are where people buy just on the web without knowing you, you're still in the beginning. You, you, you have to understand your customer, and, and at some level, that's that's it's the same. It's still selling. It's still it's still having that kind of developing that attunement for whomever your target customer or customers are. Yeah. So, and, and I think also being laser focused on who that customer is and who that customer isn't. Yeah. You know, that's where that communication, that attunement, and experience management. You know, yeah. If you know what you're trying to get at, yeah. and being really specific, yeah. they always say niche down, niche down, and I always want to fight that urge. Yeah. But the more I do that, the more success I find, because you develop, it, you know, you become a bigger fish in a small pond, I think. Yeah. Does well, that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and then, um, even if you focus on very, very targeted group customers, there are customers in that group that are going to push your, they're going to push that envelope out. You 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 can either you can either tacitly, inten you know, intentionally go out and expand into other markets, but at the same time, the customers in your core market, in, they're not all generic, so they're they're going to push your product in certain directions, and then you have a decision to make as to whether or not you want to go in that direction. If you like that, just because the customer wants to do it doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't. It may not fit with your vision, but it, but but you're going to have that information if you if you're if you're awake and aware and receptive to it. And that's listening. When you're listening, are you taking notes typically? If I'm face to face with you in a room, it's pers I, it's a it's a personal thing for me. No, like I do you swear notes, notes when you get back to your office. I do. No, I do. I will take notes if it's an important point. Just to you know, and I do it for two reasons. One is it's typically a to do item. It's something I have to follow up on. Or it's something they have to follow up on, and then and then I do it for two reasons: one, to make sure I follow up, and two, because because it imparts that I'm listening. So by just taking a note occasionally, you know, when it's an important point comes up, it it, it conveys that I'm paying attention. <clears throat> they said something particularly important, and then there's some follow up. And then at the, t at the tail end of a, a meeting, I may very well go through and say. Here's what I heard, or here's what I need to do. Here's what you're going to do, and 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 customers love that. They love. They typically they want closure. They want to know you heard what they were saying. You're committed to do certain things, and then you got to do it. You know, if you do that, you've already you've already you've already elevated your game relative to most of the people that are out. There. Yeah, because just the follow up just is just doesn't happen the way it needs to. 
I mean, I found that when I write down some specific phrases they use, yeah. and then go, hey, let me just summarize what I hear you saying, yeah. they respond very favorably. Like, look, did I say that? Yeah. yeah. Three minutes ago you said that. Because sometimes when you're talking about your problem, you're not even, you don't even know what you're saying. Yeah. You're so engrossed in it. You know, I'm sure you've all had the experience where you tell someone you like a story about work or something else, and it's like you're so passionate about the content or about the, the feelings that you don't know the words you're saying, and they hear it for what it is, but you hear it as, I'm just venting. And I think sometimes feeding them back those those words do two things. One, it reminds them of just how how it is, and two, that you really are paying attention. So, do you want to open the floor? Yeah, can I ask you one more question? Yeah, yeah. This is probably, we didn't talk about this, I'm going to go off book, but you'll, you'll be okay. <laughs> um, you deal with a lot of clients in all kinds of levels. How do you get referrals to people? Because that's one of the things I know is it's been a challenge for me at times. How do you get that referral from one business to the other business? And what's your magic? Uh, well, at, at some level, it's, it's just, uh, it's kind of the whole experience. The customers generally, um, they, they like what I do, they like how I do it, you know, how I deliver, and it makes it, uh, and if you do that, I find that it makes it very easy for them to refer you because they're not doing you a favor, they're doing whoever they're speaking to a favor. So, so the referral that they give, when, when they refer me to, to a new client, it's as much an advantage to them because they've they've done they've done so and so a favor. Hey, I'm gonna put you in touch with so and so, and so it's a it's a win for them as well. Uh, do you ask for that referral, or do they just offer it to you? Uh, they no, I, I I ask for references. Okay, but I don't typically ask for referrals. The way I get referrals is I kind of I tend to stay in touch with my former customers. Okay, and just stay kind of front of mind. In some, in some, you know, uh, unobtrusive way, I'll send them an article, or I'll, or I'll, or you, you are very good at that. I mean, you stayed in touch with me over three or four years, every five yeah. or six months. You'd yeah. say, "Oh, I saw you doing this great thing on LinkedIn." Yeah, it just yeah. very it just takes me takes a second. Really people, uplifting. People have a short attention span; no one's shorter than my own, and so it it helps to it, it just to. To make a point of kind of reaching out to people and staying in touch um, keeps you kind of front of mind. So that's how I that's how I get. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. How about some questions? Yes, I have a question, but uh, the referral thing is important because I live and die on that. I don't know. It, 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 it takes a longer, but it's certainly more effective. And I'm learning to build LinkedIn testimonials, references, and letters of introduction. Into a proposal. Yeah. Here's your budget, here's the timeline, here's how the billing works, yeah. and if you're delighted, yeah. you're going to give me a, a LinkedIn testimonial and two letters of introduction over the next six months. Don't be in a hurry. Think about it. Yeah. Make sure it's a good fit. Yeah. But introduce me to a few people. That's um, a good idea. And it works. Yeah. For you, it works. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. People, people are quite happy to provide references and referrals. What I do is, when I do a proposal, when I do a sort of, a, I usually put some some kind of reference in at the front end. People do not want to believe the salesperson. If they can believe somebody else, you know, tangential to the salesperson. So if I can, if I can, or the owner of a company. Yeah, that's another thing they don't like to believe. Right, right. And so what happened? Yeah. So. So what I find is, I have a particular style, you know, and and it makes it very easy for my customers to introduce me to others and then proceed to denigrate me in great way. <laughs> and for whatever reason, that is totally disarming, and it works it works very well. So my my customers will introduce me to people, and in some usually some humorous kind of funny, you know, very condescending way, and. For whatever reason, it makes that it makes the relationship I have with, with my prospective customer that much. It starts off on a on a on a on the easier footing. So for me, that's been been effective. I've gotten really good at asking the questions, and I see a 
it's someone you're working with and they're having success, hey, who do you know that could benefit from this as yeah. much as you have? And asking it that way, and really putting them on the spot to think about it, because they're not going to know off the top of their head. And having that discussion, you know, what, what was it that you really liked about what we've been working on? Well, this, 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 okay, who do you think that would benefit? Yeah. When, I, when I'm doing my speaking, often the organizer of an event will know someone. Yeah. Because we're all buddies, and it's like, oh, Bob, you should talk to this person. You'd be great for their event. Yeah. And it's a little more difficult in some sectors because, you know, you don't, you don't want to give away your competitor. Yeah. You don't want, but I, I find that, hey, who among your friends? Yeah. Or, and then to say, that, hey, I'll buy lunch for everyone. Yeah. If you can get us all in the room together, that'd sure. be great. And then just introduction, no sales pitch, just, hey, I'm Bob, nice to meet you. John says you guys are friends. Yeah. Then John does the work. Yeah. I mean, I just sit there. Yeah. It, it, I, I, that's, that's the best shut up location. Yeah. You know, let them tell you how great you are. Even if they get it wrong, because yeah. they will. They'll use their words, but you can always go back and fill it in later. So I think that's one thing. Does that help? Yes. Yeah, great. Other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hey. yeah. So when you guys were talking about, especially when you were speaking of, you, you were dealing with the engineering students and you saying they were both focused on Google Ads and their living work. So where I'm at is I'm in a situation where I have customer referrals, I have customers who love the service, I have customers who, you know, actually refer me. And like you were saying, price doesn't matter at that point. But the problem I have is getting into effectively communicating that I have this service that is of this quality that's not generic to prospective customers who have never heard of it. Like that's so how do you even if I can't get you to say like it might be different for every person, but sure. where's the starting point to find that avenue to the market step? I may potentially not have access to or I can't directly. You see okay. Yep. So, so let me just, uh, for the sake of everyone, if you, you can hear, what's the starting point to get into areas where you haven't been with your product or service yet after having some success? And it sounds like you have some, some great stories of people, case studies, possible testimonials, and that would be one area that I would suggest putting a sheet of paper in front of people. I often, if, when I'm talking to someone, put out testimonials. I put testimonials out on my LinkedIn page. If, if I speak and someone gives me a video, by the way, video testimonials are awesome. That, that is great on social media and that usually elicits a response. I, I also will send someone, you know, hey, by the way, uh, I, I spoke at this group, here's what they said about this to someone I've never met before because like you said, someone else's words are really valuable. What are your thoughts on the question? So, so, uh, you, so you've got customers now. Uh, it goes back to the asking questions. Uh, the first place I would go is I would go back to customers that you've got today and ask them who else, where else can I find customers like you? Or, or, or how did you hear about them? Or how, and this goes back to this just idea of, of questioning, getting back to understanding your customer, and, and, and part of that would be how do they find out about you, and why do they like you, and what sort of problems are you solving for them, and and the more specific and detailed, quantified you can make those things, the better, because uh, because that well. You get customers, your customers will ultimately, if you're doing the right thing for them and they like what you're doing, they want you to be successful. Not only because they need you. They say, successful. yeah, they, they want they need you to be successful because if you're not successful, you just create a problem for them. Right? They invest in you, they bet on you, they want this solution to work, and now it doesn't work, it's because you're not growing. So so good, good customers, good customers, and there are bad customers, but good customers want you to succeed and will help you get there. And so my the single most important piece of advice I would give you is that is that try and figure out get your customers to tell you where to find more more people like them. And and ideally they'll then also help sell you. I mean they'll they'll be able to convey to the degree they're not competitive, directly competitive. In some cases you're gonna have customers that don't want to tell someone else because they have you're giving them an advantage they don't want, and so you want to move 
further or more away market-wise. But ultimately, good customers are going to tell you where to find more of the more folks like themselves. Yes, I'm, I'm going to take that question a step farther. Sure. How would you find your first customer if you were starting out? Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll start. And, oh, I see uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, I guess you go at first to the network, whatever network you have. So it's that you're a founder, you've been out, you're, you're on your own, you, you have some level of network. So the first place I would go is, you know, I would go to all your friends and all your associates, anyone that knows you, trusts you, has some background with you. And what, that will, ha what will happen then is, is that you, one or more of those folks will, will probably be able to introduce you to someone who will introduce you to your first customer. Because in the beginning, you don't have anything except your credibility and your whatever you've created so far. You don't have a, you don't have another customer to to point to. So so it's really people that that bet on you based on you or some relationship you have with somebody else. In my own example, uh, with this this uh, startup we've got. Experts, experts. Yeah. We we've uh, we've started. And all of our customers, all of our academic medical center customers in the beginning, have been have been physicians that, that know us, use the product, which is free. You can use it on our web. Uh, it's, it's basically a medical search engine, and they've been the ones that have advocated for us inside the market because in the beginning, as you know, you're you're dealing with fear. Your first customers, it's all about fear. They're, you're, they're choosing you, or they're being asked to choose you at great personal risk and embarrassment. There's no, there's no risk of not doing something, right? Uh, like, like in my case, there's no risk not choosing us over U.S. News and World Report. It's just so safe. Uh, this, and, and going with expert state is a huge risk. And nobody does it. And you've got to overcome that. And so that's the battle that you're going to face is, is that the pine, you know, pioneers get arrows in their back, right? And so you have to figure out ways to to assuage them and understand that this isn't this isn't fear. You're bold. You're you've got vision. You're an innovator. And those sorts of things are going to kind of come into the conversation. And if you can have that conversation with the customer and they and they can convince you that they're bold, they're an innovator, they're risk averse, or they're not risk averse. They're, they're they they try new stuff. Then you've got some. And if you ask them those questions and you don't, and they don't, you got to walk away and find someone who is. Can I add sure. to that? Yeah. A couple of thoughts I had. Um, when I've started businesses, I've deeply discounted my products and services to get people to test them. Um, I, I did a uh, session for a nonprofit on something new I was doing a couple of months ago because I met the person and it was a great opportunity to do it. And the testimonial from him would be gold to me. So I've been strategic about discounting services when there's an opportunity. The other thing I've done, and I think most people overlook it, is I mine places that most people forget about, like your high school friends, your college friends, your college professors, your LinkedIn connections, the people that you played volleyball with, the people you played softball with. I mean, I go to anyone, any group and every group because those are the people that know me. The guys that I played softball with 20 years ago, they know the guy I am. And they're willing to take a chance. And one of them is going to know someone somewhere. It's a matter of just getting the word out to more and more people. The other thing I found that's really funny with my family, my father didn't believe when I started my first business that it was legit until I handed him a business card. That was like, suddenly it was like, oh, this is real. <laughs> and I, I take that to be a really good lesson. Get business cards and start handing them out and act like you are successful. I don't talk about any of the problems with my business, but with a very select group of people, including this guy, because I know he can handle it, and he'll encourage me. But my game face is on. If you ask me how business is going, whether it's here or here, I'm very positive, because people really don't want to make that, that investment 
in a failure because then they look bad. They look bad in their own world. They're also worried that if they're a friend of yours, they're worried about that relationship. Well, if this doesn't work out, I, I'll never be able to talk to Bob again. I, this is going to be awkward. We hang out. That can be really difficult. And so really looking at those places, churches, synagogues, um, uh, PTA groups. Um, I famously got a client when I was at the funeral for my father-in-law. Talking to a woman, asking her questions, she's going through all the problems she was having with the marina, and next thing you know, she goes, by the way, what do you do? I said, I help people like you have problems like that. She was like, we need to talk on Monday. They're out there. It's a matter of just looking everywhere and knowing the right questions to ask. And to get back to your point, what's the question that helps you pre-qualify someone? You know, the question I ask people all the time that works really well, What's your biggest business challenge today? If it's the right thing, boom, I'm in there. If it's not, hey, I got a guy who wrote a book that probably would really help you with that. Do you want me to give you his website? Or, oh, I know someone else. And building that network because if I can help you solve the problem you have today, you may come back to me tomorrow with another problem. And two weeks from now with the third problem, eventually one of those problems is going to work for me. Or you're going to go, Bob, you've been so great to me. How can I help you? Ding, ding, ding. I'm looking for this. And I find that works really well. So, does that help? Yes, thank you. Great. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, you said that you've been in the business for like, before I was born. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> sure. Okay, I'm going to just look at you for that. I, mean, I, didn't, I, I couldn't tell the classes that you put there with you and me. I didn't say that. So I didn't say it. I mean, the both, this is a question for the both of you. So I'm just wondering. Um, the old guys. <laughs> now that, I mean, because I, I was like probably three when this, whatever, here we go. So, um, before and now that digital marketing is such a thing and like everything's so digital and online, when digital wasn't such a big deal in the marketing sales space, was it there, <laughs> is there something, an aspect like a principle or something about sales and communication that you believe has been lost as digital has become a thing? Or you know, I start? Sure. sure. I'm going to tell you face to face works really well. If I, there's a reason why I'm here this morning. I will achieve more results from this group, you seeing me face to face, than any webinar, podcast, Instagram feed, ebook. I, I, I can, and I've done them all I, face to face because you're seeing me. You're seeing that I didn't pre-program this. That we have. A, I'd like to think you see we have good rapport, and that we're normal guys. And that we can take questions. It's not like, oh, that's a great question. Wait, let me check my notes for 10 minutes and get back to you. Yeah. I, I think that face-to-face, -face, looking people in the eye, listening to them, and letting them almost feel your pulse really makes a difference. And I think we, we tend to, you know, texting and, and phone calls and Zoom conferences and all, which are great tools. But if you give me a chance to get in the room with someone, I'm going to take it. I'll drive 100 miles to meet you in person because I know when you sit in the room with me, you're going to buy from me. I, I just know it because I've got that passion that doesn't come through on the phone call. I can stand, I can smile, I can do all that stuff that you're supposed to do on a phone call, but you, you're you flying all over the country and meet with people, yeah, right? Yeah. At great personal expense, right? Yeah. And why? Well, I mean, because, yeah, face-to-face -face meeting. Being with someone, being able to talk to someone face to face is, is invaluable. You just, you just, it, it, it conveys commitment, it conveys, you know, empathy. You, you, you get to understand, you get to see, uh, you get to see, uh, 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 you get to read people. So I have a kind of a hierarchy of, uh, of, of communication. So you know, text is at the bottom, and then it's email, and then it's a phone call. And then it's video calls, and then it's in person. So, so I've only made it to the texting level. Oh, so this is good to know where I rank. So, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to thank you both very, very much. This is great. I'm running out to get a beer. All right, all right. 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 All right
And then please stay and finish off the bit. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope everybody enjoyed. See you Friday night. So, so I, so, uh, so I do some certain things that um, they're, they're in the book. <laughs> now what is what is what You're is supposed to hold the book up exactly? What is is I I was still believing in, in in writing uh, cards. So I I write people notes like physical notes and, and, and throw them in the in the mail. I know that sounds old school, but it shocks the crap out of people when you do it. Uh, they also and, save them forever. I've been in people's offices yeah. where it's like yeah. front, like their kids drawing. Yeah, it's just it's it's just interruptive in a way uh, that's kind of pleasant and, and uh, it's an anachronism. Uh, and the other is uh, uh, video. I find video phone calls to be really invaluable, partly because people still aren't using them for their TV show. And if you are, it does. You know, travel is. Tough to you, but even if you're across town, it's a hassle to go back. So, so I, I do believe in personal visits, but at the same time, if, if you have to have a phone call and you can make a video call, you're so much better off. And, you know, because it conveys so much more information, number one. And number two is you have to pay attention, and they have to pay attention. And, uh, and you, you can't look at your you can't surf the web or or or, uh, or take another call. You have to be you have to be present, and that goes back to this whole idea. Of this. And, and I just started doing video calls not that long ago, maybe two months ago, and I thought people were going to just react poorly to it. I've yet to have a person say no, yeah. and, and then they'll be like, "Oh, I look good today." I'm like, "I never look good," <laughs> and then they'll yeah. turn on the video. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it, it really does work well, and yeah. and, and I think. Certainly, as we go forward, that's going to become more and more prominent. But I still think face to face is. Oh, yeah. sure. I, I, I like I like to shake hands. Yeah. Oh yeah. Other questions? Yes, Peter. So often, someone will email me in with uh, an email introduction. Peter, you and so and so would be fab together, or there may be a fit here somewhere. I think. Sure. Uh, here's the introduction, and you all take it from here. Great. Coffee's on me. <clears throat> Looks me. And I don't really know anything about it. It's cold but warm. So I, in terms of soft skills and sales process, I find myself getting a little over eager at times and explaining what I do as if they were a predisposed buyer of something. And I don't know that that works. And I'm wondering how to go into a ambiguous first meeting I'm happy to and, and, and keep it casual and fun so that they like me, people buy from people they like, and still do some ruthless qualifying that isn't so obvious. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's kind of a, a rambling so, so I think, I, I, I think but your question is a, a very light introduction. How do you go into that meeting not being a salesperson yes. but getting what you need? And I, working through this book with Brendan was great because I was going through the sales journey and learning a lot. Yeah. One of the things I had to learn was I don't talk about what I do now until you ask me. I will ask you questions till the cows come home. I will learn about you. And finally, there's always a question to go, why are you asking me these questions? Well, what do you seem like you know this, you seem like you know something here. That's when I open the door. But I want, and I also provide them value within that discussion. Like, have you ever thought about this? I'll give them a taste of what working with Bob looks like, but I do not do the hardcore sales ever. In fact, it was hard for me here I don't know if I even did it. I tried not to. I don't like to do the, I'm Bob, I do this, 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 and here's how I can help you. That just doesn't work. I want them to, to want to know what I do because then I can tailor it to their problem. I also go into those discussions not believing they're a client. Yeah, okay. That's the other one. I, I, I go into the discussion as an opportunity to discover a business person's life. That's what I look for. And if there's a fit, it will come to me. It'll come to them, but I don't believe it to be a sales call. Even if the person says, oh my God, John needs exactly what you need, because John may not believe it. 
Right. And, and, and you can again, you can't convince John. Only John can convince John. So it may not be the right time. So I walk, I want to walk out of there with John understands me. He gets how I roll. And he understands that I care about him and his business. So when he's ready for a solution, he'll call me. Is that that, which is kind of, kind of a combination of what we were yeah, saying yeah. in the summary. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through, right, we're going through a process right now where we're trying to uh, work in the running to get some funding. And and one of the things I've, uh, now I, I have this lens on all the time where I think in terms of how how finance, how good venture capitalists and, and, uh, and uh, incubators look at companies. And, and so, so I would say, the way I would figure it out is people always understand things in terms of some other thing. And so we're the, we're the J.D. Power for medical expertise. And to some level, if you have to convey what it is you do, I find that it's really helpful to be able to, to explain it in terms that are like something else. I, you know, I'm the Steven Spielberg for the small entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I'm the, or I'm the, the Spielberg. That, that was gold. You know, so something like, you know, so people like I am surely this way. I think in terms of something in relationship to something else. I so, so like storytelling. Yes. I mean, so because for me, like you know, for most for most people, it's just easier to absorb something if it's delivered in a way that's digestible. And for me. I, I can pick up something if it's a story or if it's visual, much more so than if someone just tells me a fact or I see the data. It also so, stays longer. Yeah, so so to me, my, my piece of advice there would be, if you can find some way to to distill what it is you do in some way that's referenceable to, already referenceable to them, then they understand it, number one, and number two is it probably is a prompt for a conversation. Oh, it's an invitation to explore that more. I like your answer better than mine. I would jump that. <laughs> they were both good. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So if your business is a business to business to consumer yes. endeavor, and you've gotten a deep, uh, deeper understanding of both the business you're marketing to and the end consumer, but you can tell that there's a gap in between the business's understanding of the consumer with respect to the service you want to offer. How do you go about marketing that to the business? So like the consumer senses that there's a major need for something, but the business doesn't necessarily. Like, how do you bridge that gap? Can, 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 go, you want? I, I, you, whatever you want. You, okay, uh, well, I, I'm going through this right now in my own company. So. The, I have managers and employees in organizations that want and need training and soft skills. They totally see it, but then they take it to the human resources people or the CEO, and they go, "Why would I spend the money on that? Because if I if I do that, they're just going to leave to go to better jobs. I have to pay more." So there is that disconnect. The, I just keep pushing at that lower level and hope that that message keeps coming up. And then I try to get in front of the higher level at events like this, <coughs> at workshops, so that they start to get a sense that's coming from both directions. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what we're talking about, but it's a slow process. I, I wish I could just get a manager to sign, you know, cut a $20,000 check. Problem is it's gotta go up the food chain and the training budgets spread different ways. And it doesn't always work that way. So I'm I'm trying to be consistent there, but also look at ways to get in front of those people with everything from magazine articles, LinkedIn connections, doing these types of things, because these types of things tend to resonate with that higher level employee more so than a manager. Is that yeah. Give, give me one percent. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's I smile because that's a that's a real hard problem. And it's a problem that, that I'm, co I'm contending with as well, because because we have a kind of uh, a business to business to consumer model as well. And uh, I don't know. This is not a satisfying answer to you, but my, and what, what wouldn't be if I were sitting there? Uh, but in my experience, where I, we've had success with this, 
Uh, it's because the consumer, uh, we've been able to get influential consumers to, to explain to our business customer the value in terms that the, they understand. And for whatever reason, good reason really, that they, they are much more inclined to listen to a consumer because they do know that market, they do understand that customer. And so, so the, the challenge has been for us has been to find super empowered consumers. And when you do, they are gold. They're in so many ways. They're references, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, lead generators, uh, they're, uh, they're board members, they're any number of things. And so I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but but I find that if I can have like I may be the most knowledgeable person about my product and my service, but if I can get other people to do a reasonably good job of selling it, they don't have to be as good as I do. If I can get references or others to, to sell or to or to emphasize certain things on my behalf, uh, and that's uh, that is a uh, an underused, that, that is an invaluable resource. That would be the way I kind of put it that well, right? Oh, yes, sir. Um, so, uh, a lot of what you guys have talked about, uh, you know, the, the big fish in a little pond mentality of um, finding that uh, niche market that you focus on. Um, and a lot of what you're talking about is very product based. Um, I am a sort of business to business. Uh, service provider, essentially, um, uh, real estate developers and architects come to me to develop, like I said, pretty pictures from architects. Yeah. Um, most, or if not all, of my sales come from um, re personal references. True. Um, how do I, I guess, I'm having trouble with expanding on those reference um, to other, you know, other potential clients, I'm having trouble expanding on that. So I can only go so far with those references. Um, how can I leverage those references, I guess, into um, something a little bit more marketable? I, I'm not really sure where. I know my client. I'm not really sure how to find more of them. Uh, at this point, and I'm looking to grow those that client base. I'm not really sure how because all of my business is so dis decentralized, yeah. uh, if you will, and my biggest competitors are like China and India, undercutting me on price constantly. So my my sale is myself right. most of the time. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to see what the scalability of that is and how to um, start selling that more effectively. I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of rambling. No, no, I get it. I, well, a lot that you guys said. I mean, that I, okay, uh, well, can, yeah. can you clarify the question just for yeah. your question? Sorry. Yeah, so, so you, you, you've got customers. Yeah. They're happy. Yeah. And, and, you've, and, and you're <laughs> geographically dispersed, so you don't, have the, you don't have the benefit of a concentrated group of customers. And so, so how, do you, how do you grow that? Um, uh, well, the... I guess I guess the way I would start I would start by saying, congratulations, you got good customers and they're happy with you. That's half the battle. So when you and now um, I'm not going to go into how much you can scale or not, but you know because that that can, that dictates some of what you might how you might approach it. But if you've got customers that are willing to talk about you and that are willing to go on record, <coughs> and then I I. I go back to the point of what specifically is it that gives, what is the advantage that you derive, that they derive from you? Like what specifically? Does it help them reduce cost? Does it help them, uh, uh, does, it, do they, does it improve their win rate? And by how much can you quantify those sorts of things? Does it, does it, uh, does it, is it a happier customer experience for their customer? Because ultimately, if you really want to think about this farther along, it's, how does it? How does what you do help them 
and help their customers. Because if you can help their customers, then they're doubly motivated. Right? So, so to the degree to which you can understand that and then articulate that, then it becomes it becomes a marketing problem. It becomes how do you communicate that, you know, to others. And 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 you know, so even at a sales level, when you talk to somebody who's in the market, it's hey, this is this is what I've, I've done for XYZ Corporation. You know, this is how much I. This is what they were able to do. You know, they decrease staff or increase profits or increase number of customers or increase customer satisfaction, what have you. And you know, and then the, and then the next question is, does any of that interest you? And at some level, you know. You, uh, you, you basically are challenging them. Are you interested in these sorts of things? And if you're not, then you've qualified and you move on. But that, that would, those would be some of the things I would kind of, I would kind of focus on. Okay. If I can just add, you, you said we both sell products. I sell services. I, I sell coaching and training, so there's nothing really on paper. That, that yeah. Someone gets, yes, I sell books, but that's a small part of my business. So I'm I'm in the world you're in. Yeah. And one of the things I would say is it's a matter of how big the funnel is. That's what I've realized because you've got again not people coming into a sales funnel that you can find the people that you can actually serve. And there's some ways to do that with LinkedIn Sales Navigator with some other techniques. Yeah. And, you could, and, we, and I, I have some ideas for you if you want to talk about that. But there are ways to do that. But the big thing is. You know that everyone you talk to isn't going to be the ideal client, so you've got to bring enough people in that the shakeout yeah. gets you those two or three new ones each month, and that's what I've been going through in my business. And there are some ways to do that. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Peter. So I'm trying to sell to, let's say, professional services. They have differentiation issues, and I can help them with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at a website for lawyers, accountants, whatever it may be. <clears throat> There's ten partners. And I know this all too well, Peter. And then they have staff. Yeah. And I'm not sure what my first move is. Do I do I pick a partner based on their looks on the about section? <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, where it's got an email that I can do something with, or do I go to a staff person? So I'm asking about what is my strat entry strategy. To find the, per the, 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 the influencer yeah. in a blind situation. Is it staff person who, you know, it could be, this is what I do, who, who should I talk to? Right. I would start with LinkedIn connections. And I would build my LinkedIn network and pray that I know someone connected to someone on LinkedIn who's connected to that firm. Because if you call the managing partner, you will not get a return call. If you call... The administrative head, you will not get a return call. And if you call the junior partner, you will get a 45 minute discussion and he will never ever talk to the right, right person. So it's a it's a matter of leveraging those connections, which is where events like this what did you call it? LinkedIn what? LinkedIn uh, just making connections on LinkedIn. And I can I can talk to you about what that looks like okay. and how you do that. But you do a lot of that as well, right? Yeah, well yeah. Uh, don't you use? I thought you used LinkedIn. I, I use I use LinkedIn uh, to find out who the right people to talk to are. I I email. I call. I, you know. I I try to get introductions through people that I know. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess it helps to know upfront what their pro what it is they're trying to accomplish. Um, but in my case. Certain certain academic medical centers are just fixated on U.S. news rankings, and we can help them with some of that U.S. news rankings. So I go in. Part of it is, hey, your U.S. news rank, U.S. news rankings are here. We can help you get to here, and and that's a very specific thing that they're motivated by. If you have that thing, that kind of helps open the door. But to who the right person is, you know that. I don't, I don't well, know the the from the company yeah. to company. I mean, yeah. I, I, I've worked with uh, you know insurance agencies. And sometimes it's the owners. Sometimes it's the managing person. Sometimes it's one of the field agents who sees the value and make and bubbles up. That I think that's the challenge for what you do and what I do more than anything else. His is a lot more concrete, it, and, and that makes it hard. But it, it is knowing that language. 
having asked the right questions of enough people that you know what you can say to a person if they go, so why are you calling? I mean, you got to have a 10, 15 second thing. Like, is Steven Spielberg, um, yeah, uh, 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 I don't know, what was it? It was a <laughs> community, <laughs> right. It's on tape. But that, that would be really powerful, and if you can say it in a way, you know, I used to have a marketing company I did a lot of work with that I owned, and I said, you know, I help people find their ideal customers, the people that want and need what they're selling, and people would come up to me like, whoa, how do you know they want, how do you make sure they want needs, like we pre qualify That got me in the door. You know, now with what I'm doing, it's I help people and companies reinvent themselves. Whoa, what do you mean reinvent? I mean, like, you've got to figure out how, what you're going to be tomorrow that isn't what you are today. And they go, wow, how do you do that? You just want to get that discussion because if you start having the discussion, that's where good things happen. But if you just call and go, hey, um, I'm Bob and uh, I do soft skills training. You're wasting your time. I, I can tell you because I did those calls for about three months and made, I don't know, 1,200 calls. Went nowhere. Except one of the 1,200 calls put in my CRM and went nowhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, yeah, that, I, that, that's the evolution. You probably yeah. made silly calls somewhere in your career yeah. as well. A whole bunch. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. part of it. Yeah. And, and I think you learn from it. That's right. And when you get to that day where you go, this is not working. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and you've spun wheels long enough, that's when you look for answers. And I think that's where Brendan's book is really valuable. I, I, I got the privilege of editing it, but it really is a great tool that I I, uh, I hope he's going to sign a copy for me one day. He doesn't give me one. I don't know if I have it. <laughs> so, any other questions? Um, well, yes. You, I, you guys talked a lot about uh, connecting specifically with decision makers at the end of the day. Uh, and, and the strategy of doing that. And then you also, oh, I don't know the right turn on, but two food that Google ads essentially. Uh, so, but you also touched on building a sales funnel. So, uh, I, there's no talk of marketing to build that sales funnel. Uh, that, I, that I recall that's a conversation. I'm not I'm talking about marketing you know, all day. Yeah, we do yeah. have some cool things. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that wasn't the purpose of the. Yeah. Marketing is a, a, is a is a horse of a different color. It's mm -hmm. another it's a it's another tool in the toolbox, so to speak. And, and I'm not suggesting that there's no such thing as marketing. I'm suggesting that at some level, in the beginning, when you're early on, marketing is marketing and sales are hard to distinguish. Now, if you've got a product that's a that's an electronic product and it's entirely ad based and so forth, that's a different thing. You still need to understand who your customers are. And, and so forth. Right. At some level, that's 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 still sales. But uh, yeah, I, well, I, I guess what I was trying to get to is you're now in front of somebody. You're, you're having a conversation. It's a sales opportunity. It's a it's a one on one conversation. At that level, those are sales skills. Those that's not you're not marketing, right? right? And so marketing to me is is getting someone to the point where you're having a conversation, right? Now, if you're selling something on the web and they just click and they put their credit card in, I would, I would argue that's not selling at all. That's marketing. It, may, it, may, it may generate a sale, but there's no selling involved. That selling is all taking, taking place already, and it's, and it's a different, that's a different, uh, that's a completely different thing. So I'm not, by the way, Google's done pretty good. And they, they they're making payroll, and they they figured out how to do something. So I'm not knocking Google Ads. No, not, I'm not either. But yeah. I think a lot of people think it's the magic bullet. And what I think we have been saying about marketing, if you read between the lines, is relationships are the way to market. So it's coming to an event like this. It's coming to the dinner, the uh, closing thing Friday night, and talking to people, and in a room of eighty people. Maybe there's one person, and instead of handing your cards to 80 people, and I look for one or two people. I will take into an event like that three cards. I want to have three significant discussions, and the minute I have enough of a discussion with someone to feel like it's valuable, I want to take that to a coffee some other time. Hey, you're busy, you want to meet other people. 
I, I, I want to meet other people. Can I schedule a coffee with you? I will contact you Monday. Let's find a time for coffee. If they say yes, I grab their card and I move on. I, do, I don't believe in the slam and, and burn approach. You know, I've been to networking events where someone gives out, oh, I gave out 200 cards. Yeah, and the dry cleaner got probably three of them, and the trash can got the other 160, because I do it all the time. But if someone's really valuable to me, like I've been talking to Peter, I know where his card is, I will track down Peter in the next 24 hours, we'll get together, because we have something that's worth talking about. That's what I'm looking for, and I think the more you can find those people, but you've got to go out and put yourself out in those situations. Mm -hmm. I spend... I, 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 complain to my wife all the time. I spend more time creating content and marketing than I actually do doing my job. Yes. It's, there are days, this is a day, for instance, where I'm not doing any training or coaching all day. I did a lot yesterday, but today is a total marketing content creation day. And that's how it is when you start a business. You're out there, and I know you're spending countless hours on that. Uh, so so uh, there's there's definitely a school of thought, or there's definitely a, uh, a strategy called where, you, where the product leads your sales. It's product, you know, product lead marketing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and and that is a brilliant, uh, it's, that's, if, you, if you can get to that point, that's a phenomenal way to sell. And because, so small, small because selling, Selling is selling one on one is expensive, and as a company, you're going to get to the point where you get successful. And you you have, if you want to scale, if you want to get big, you have to get to the point where you, where the sale becomes essentially automatic. And I think that's what you're getting to is if you can, if you can do a Google Ads and drive the traffic and you go to a website and order, that's great. And and by all means, you want to do that because because selling one on one is expensive. For a lot of products, for a lot of companies, you have to start out selling one-on-one, -on -one. and uh, because you have to understand the customer, you have to understand what the requirements are, you have to see how the product works in the field, those sorts of things. Not always, but a lot of the time. And in those cases, you need you need salespeople. You need someone who's a salesperson. If you're a founder, it's probably you because you can't afford anyone else because salespeople are expensive and they're, they're and you get, uh, they can be a crapshoot. But at some level in the beginning, most of the time, you have to sell at some level. And that's, that was the point of this conversation. It's not to say that Google ads aren't great and effective or LinkedIn ads aren't great or many things on Facebook aren't great. Those are all, those are all tools in the toolkit. But, but this conversation is really about when you get from a customer, what does that mean? And those tool, you know, LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or whatever those ads look like, they do work, but you've got to know what your message is, yeah, which gets back to the idea yeah. you got to know your customer. Yeah. So many people go out and buy Google ads saying what they want to say, and they get no results, and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and go nowhere. When you can really crystallize that message and know that's a message where when you say it in a room, people go, oh, I want to know more. Now you have something that you can take to those services, but I did it. I put out some really bad ads, spent $100 over a weekend, spent 200 bucks over a weekend, and got nothing, and then I blame it all on Google Ads or LinkedIn Ads. It's not them. It's me not having the right language. So don't put the cart before the horse. Get that language, which is what we've really been trying to get at. And thinking that most of the businesses that we would be talking to here are in those early stages. Certainly, in the early stages, messaging is critical, right? So, but like, it's always nice to have people, like, if it's a decision maker, CFO, CEO, it's hard to get your time, yeah. especially if they're not going to buy from you, they're not interested, but you still want to get to do that. How do you do that? How do you continue to uh, improve messaging, but do it the way that um, piss doesn't piss people off, right? Like, every customer you talk to, you do that. Right. And messaging can change very quickly. Um, I, so I guess like it's easy to say that like you know improve your messaging, but how do you do that? Everyone has to eat. Yeah, there's a great, April Dunford wrote a really good book on this yeah. on messaging. Yes, and, and I would I would recommend it's, it's, it's April, April Dunford. I can't Dunford. remember the book. Yeah, it's 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 called Pro, it's uh I'll, I can, I'll I'll figure it out. I yeah. can tell you, but. Uh, 
it's April Dunford. Uh, and, uh, and it's a good book. It's, it's way more wonky than I would do. I mean, it's way more detailed. But it does a really good job of explaining product messaging and how to go about it. And, and, and she, uh, she did a couple interviews, podcasts, that you could probably find. And they're probably just as good as listening to watching the book. Um, she's uh, about how to understand product messaging, and, and 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 her book is really a discipline on how to, the steps to go through to to kind of to kind of get to that key point. Why it resonated for me is it's got a lot of examples, and the examples have to be in industries where I was where I was actually in the same competitive companies with her, so I kind of it really made sense. So, but it's a good it's a good book. It's worth it's worth reading. A couple of places I've found to find potential clients to talk to is um, nonprofit organizations. Get on the board and volunteer. Yeah, because you're around the room with people and before and after, and they have an annual event. You get you do that. Golf tournaments. I have a, I have a friend who volunteers at golf tournaments for charities and works the registration desk. Meets all kinds of people, and then you know. If you're giving back in that way, people want to talk to you. Oh, hey, John, I've been trying to get in touch with you. Yeah. And that so outside of sales, I'm very comfortable with, and I'm a big believer in in person meetings, handwritten notes, the calls, but I think the long lines of these kind of skills kind of get that message out. Because yeah, it's yeah. scale. Yeah, it, it, it is the name of the game. Yeah. I, I think there are a million great products and services that fail. Not because it was a bad product or service, right. but because the messaging didn't resonate with the potential audience. I, I, I've seen it. Yeah. I've worked with companies where I, I helped them with their messaging, and as soon as we got that messaging clear, their sales started to go up because people could figure out what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really at its core, what we've talked about for the last you know, 75 minutes is how do you work on getting that messaging? How do you how do you do do those discussions so that when you're in the room with someone, they go, I get it, right? And, that, and he's a master at it. And in his book, I keep saying this book's great, it really is. It's a great tool for, for really answering some of these questions, and he's got some great tips on little things that you go, oh, it's not, oh, wow, that's a really good idea. And, and every time I would start playing with part of it, there'd be something like, oh, I've forgotten to do that. Oh, I should do that. Like he's got a great anecdote in there about how he got a pass within a company, so he looked like an employee. So he could be in the—he didn't have to look like an outsider, and that gave him access to people and information in a way that he couldn't get by being the guy at the front desk who had to be let in. And I think those are the kinds of things that your book really gets at. Thank you very much yeah, for your thank attention. Thank you so much. And you all your great questions. And, uh, and if you have books, if you'd like to buy them, thank you.